Thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. Today's podcast is from November 17th, 2019. Join us as we continue our series on the book of Hebrews with Pastor Dax. said about preaching that it is the preacher's job to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And it sounds a little bit like a fortune cookie, I know. But I think those words pretty well convey the the biblical balance of the goal of preaching. To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I mean, we certainly see that even within Jesus' ministry, don't we? I mean, we know that many times he continually comforts the afflicted. He shows love and and mercy and compassion and, and patience towards many, many people. But if you've ever read through the Gospels, then you also know that there are plenty of times where he afflicts the comfortable. And that little phrase there, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, that that pretty well uh, captures something of the way this letter to the Hebrews is put together, actually. Uh, Remember, this guy who's writing this letter, he knows uh, his audience, these Hebrew Christians, Uh, He knows something of the challenges that they're already facing and even more what's coming their way in the future. And so he, as he puts this letter together, he alternates between passages that are intended to comfort them with passages that are intended to afflict and challenge and convict. So if we think back, his purpose in the first chapter of this letter is pretty obvious, isn't it? It's to comfort the afflicted. Remember how he did that? He, he just points relentlessly to the supremacy of Jesus Christ compared, first of all, to the prophets, and then he spends much of the chapter in proving how much greater Jesus is than the angels. And, and so what did he do to comfort these people? Remember, they're facing increasing hostility, increasing persecution. What does he say? You know, it'll be okay. God's going to get you out of this pretty soon. Maybe if you just have a little more faith, God will improve your situation. Maybe if you give a little bigger seed gift, right, then God will respond by taking those difficulties away. No, none of that nonsense, right? How does he comfort them in chapter one? Simply by reminding them of the greatness of the person in whom they've placed their faith. This person who, in many ways, was the very reason they were being afflicted. But this person who is greater and infinitely more glorious than any other person or thing in all of the universe, even the angels. That's the point of chapter one, to comfort the afflicted. And if you've ever experienced uh, facing opposition or harassment for your faith in Jesus at whatever level, uh, but maybe where it's even caused you to to doubt a little bit. It's caused your faith to waver a little bit. If you've experienced that, then then you know that there is nothing that brings you greater comfort and relief than to hear again about the greatness of your Savior. Because it reminds you that he is well worth every bit of affliction that you are or will or ever could go through. If your picture of Christ is is this little, small, weak, insignificant Christ, then that's an easy thing to walk away from, right? But if you have a picture of Jesus Christ like what's presented in the first chapter of Hebrews that is glorious and great and supreme and preeminent, that is a Christ that captivates you. That is a Christ you would even be willing to die for. So in chapter 1, he comforts the afflicted. But in chapter 2, as we saw last week, he breaks his train of thought there for just four brief verses. Why? It's to interject the first of five warnings that are spread throughout this letter. And that, that warning in Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, it's the shortest of all the warnings in the letter, but it is clearly intended to afflict the comfortable. Remember uh, that very strong question that he asks in chapter 2, verse 3? How shall we escape 
if we neglect such a great salvation. The weight of that question hung over us last Lord's Day as we consider the, the danger spoken of in those four verses that, that the Christian, the professing Christian, can be vulnerable to an imperceptible drift away from Jesus Christ. And what, what ought to cause you to sit up a little straighter in your chair this morning is to realize that this warning here about this dangerous drift it's not given to those people who've heard the gospel and then just rejected it. No, this warning is for those people who are comfortable with the gospel. This is a warning for church-going folks. These are people who hear the gospel. They understand the gospel. They sing the gospel. They study the gospel. In some sense, they've maybe even experienced some of the benefits of the gospel. But when that nearness to the gospel becomes uncomfortable, you know, when, when a little bit of pressure is added or, or, or a little bit of commitment is asked for, then they find it much more convenient to loosen their grip on the gospel just for a little while, just a little bit. And what happens? Well, as we saw last week, the anchor dislodges from the bedrock of Jesus Christ and the drift begins and some people never recover from it. And because the stakes are so high, the writer takes those first four verses of chapter two to afflict the comfortable. But when we come to verse five, he picks up where he left off at the end of chapter one. And he, he resumes his work now of comforting the afflicted. And what shape does this comfort take this time? Well, I want you to imagine the, the context, again, of who he's writing to. There's this little church right in the heart of the Roman Empire. They're surrounded by power and wealth and success and influence and strength. And here is this little ragtag group of believers. They've been shunned by their families for the gospel. They're despised by the Roman culture around them because of the gospel. They probably gather on the Lord's Day, not in some beautiful building, but in a humble home. They have no status, no significance, no importance. It would be easy to feel small, wouldn't it? In a day when uh, bigger was better and, and might made right. Imagine the embarrassment of, of sneaking around like these people had to do to meet with a bunch of other apparent losers. Right? Imagine just the whispers at the marketplace or, or at the place they work. Oh, she, she meets with the Christians now, you know. Or on Monday morning. What, so what did you do yesterday? the pressure and the temptations to cave in would be tremendous. Who wants to be on a team that seems to be losing? Who wants to feel embarrassed and insignificant and out of touch? And so the writer here in this passage, in verses 5 through 9, he's saying to them essentially, don't be deceived by appearances. Yes, Rome is, is big and powerful and in charge for now. But because of what Jesus has done for you, and because of what God has in store for you, a, a dignity that is so incredibly glorious, everything alluring and tempting about Rome pales in comparison. That's what we want to see this morning, that, that God has a significance and a dignity for his people. A, a dignity that when you understand it properly, it cancels out, it neutralizes the attractiveness of the world around you. It's a significance that has been secured for you by Jesus Christ. So let's, let's look at our text here. Let's look at verse 5. Hebrews 2, verse 5, he writes, Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. So what, what's going on here? I mean, this just sort of seems to come out of nowhere. But remember... Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, is just a brief interruption in his flow of thought. So he picks up here where he left off at the end of Hebrews 1. 
in verse 14. In fact, that first word that says now, it could also be translated for. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. And that little word there at the beginning of the sentence is important because it connects what we're about to read in this sentence with what came before. And what was that? Well, that's the, that's the end of chapter 1, that Jesus Christ is preeminent over even the angels, right? Angels, they're great, wonderful, powerful, but they are just creatures. Jesus, on the other hand, is the creator, right? And so, again, in chapter 1, he just proves over and over again how much greater Jesus is compared to the angels. And then as, as that chapter draws to a close, he speaks of a, a future day, in verse 13, when the Son of God will have unchallenged dominion where all of his enemies will be made a footstool for his feet. Now, at the present, Jesus Christ wages war with his enemies, not out of necessity, I might add, but according to his own good purpose, according to his own good timing. But that purpose, that timing, will one day come to an end. And when it does, every rebel against God, even down to the tiniest, defiant Adam, will be crushed under his feet. That's where he picks up from that point now to verse 5, chapter 2. After speaking about the angel, he says, it wasn't to the angels that God subjected the world to come. Right In the world to come, on that great and final day, Jesus Christ will return and he will reign and rule over all things. The angels won't do that, right? At, at the end of chapter 1, we're told that the angels are servants. They, they minister to us on behalf of God. Jesus will rule and reign. One day, everything in all of creation will be willfully, knowingly subject to Jesus Christ. Now, even now, at this very moment, Jesus reigns from heaven, right? Even now, the angels do his bidding. There's no competition between Jesus and the angels, right? The, the distance between the two of them is immeasurable. But that, that raises a question that this writer anticipates that his Hebrew readers of this letter might have. Don't forget, he's writing here to Jewish Christians initially. Right? People who know something about angels from reading their Old Testament. People who'd been exposed to all sorts of fanciful ideas about angels that had grown in popularity between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, that period of 400 years. And more than that, many Jews we know from reading Scripture struggled with the idea of a Messiah who would come in human flesh and then die on a cross. And it seems like, reading between the lines here a little bit, that, that perhaps even some of these Jewish Christians were wondering something like, so, so Jesus came and took on human form, including all of the limitations and, and weaknesses that come with being human? I mean, he was so human that he bled and died on a cross? Well, if that's true, how, how then can Jesus as a human be superior to the angels? The angels are strong and powerful. They, they will never die. How is Jesus qualified to rule over all things as if he's got human weakness, including the angels? That, that's the issue that the writer is getting at here. And he's going to answer that really in two parts, okay? So here's the first answer. The first way he wants to address this is by reminding his readers that dominion over creation was what God intended for humanity from the beginning. Dominion over all of the created order was God's intention for humanity from the very beginning. Basically, he's, he's telling his readers here... What, I don't understand what's the problem here. You, you've forgotten your own Old Testament. right? Because from the very beginning, Genesis 1, it was God's design that humans exercise dominion over the created order. Let's just remind ourselves of that. We want to look at Genesis 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do you hear that little word that was repeated over and over again? The word over? Let them have dominion over. You are over them. From the very beginning, humanity was created in the image of God and humanity was given a very clear mandate. You are to rule over the created order. Now, back to Hebrews, and in, in chapter 2, verse 6, he starts quoting from Psalm 8, which David read for us earlier. And, and Psalm 8 is a, a poetic expression of this same mandate by God given to humanity to rule over all creation. So as David sits and composes Psalm 8, uh, we know from reading it, it seems like he's thinking about the night sky. He's thinking about the stars, the moon, all of the, the beauty that is hung in space by God's own hand. And then in Psalm 8, David bursts into spontaneous praise. He says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your name is great, he's saying. And then it's almost like he scratches his head and he wonders to himself, but Lord, here's, here's what I don't get. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set in place. And here's where the writer of Hebrews picks it up in verse six. What is man that you are mindful of him? Amidst all of the, the glory and greatness of creation, what is this speck of dust that interests you so deeply? Why do you pay attention to humanity? Why are you concerned about us? And in the next line, he says, or the son of man that you care for him. That word care for, it's used elsewhere in the New Testament to refer to visiting a person who is sick. It means to look after, to attend to, uh, to be responsible for. That is what God is said to do for us human beings. And I think all of us need more of David's perspective here to recognize our smallness in the scope of things, right? So many in our day think of God as a, a sort of genie that exists to perform on demand for us. But look at David's perspective here. On the other hand, he is awestruck that the God of the universe would give even the smallest amount of consideration to someone like him. Job asks the very same kind of question. He says, what is man that you make so much of him that you set your heart on him? What do humans contribute to God? Even in the slightest way? Nothing. So why does God care about us? Why does he even think about us? I mean, do you ever wonder about that? But then David answers his own question by identifying God's intended purpose for humanity, referring all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It says, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. Him, as in mankind, humanity. So do you see what he's saying here? He's talking about humanity's place of dignity in the created order. God created humanity just a little lower than the angelic realm, and even at that point, only for a little while. Do you realize that in all of God's creation, only one thing is said to be made in God's image? You. Me. That is a position and a destiny that is greater than even that of the angels, right? Angels are, again, are certainly awe-inspiring creatures, but the Bible never says they're made in God's image. Us, on the other hand, it says that we're made only for a little while, lower than the angels. But one day we'll be above the angels. Did you know this? 
According to 1 Corinthians 6, it says that one day humanity will rule alongside Jesus over the angels, even judging the angels. Is that new to you? It's not new to God. It was part of his design from the very beginning. Human beings occupy the exalted place in the created order. And notice here too, back to Hebrews 2, that human beings possess a delegated authority over the created order, right? It says, you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. That's never been said of angels. Adam and Eve were the king and queen of creation under God's lordship, but given an awesome responsibility to rule over everything. And notice how comprehensive that was intended to be. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, humanity, that is, putting everything in subjection to humanity, he left nothing outside his control. Nothing outside his control. That implies that human dominion includes ruling over even the angelic realm. Are you getting this? That God's intended purpose is that humanity occupies the exalted place in creation? And the way that he makes that evident is because God gives us dominion over all things. This is the dignity that God had in mind when he breathed life into Adam. This is the the dignity and the, the sense of worth that God has for human beings. Contrary to a a lot of nonsense that you'll find out there, there is such a thing as a biblical doctrine of self-worth. But we have to be careful to understand it biblically, right? It's it's not, uh, you don't want to fall victim to the the sub-Christian idea that uh, attempts to build up your self-esteem by saying, you know, you are a person of great worth. How do you know? Because Jesus died for you. That's how wonderful you were when the Bible actually tells us the very opposite, right? Jesus didn't die for you because you were so good and worthy and wonderful. Jesus died for you because you were so bad and unworthy. And that's what shows his love as so great, right? If you start to elevate human worthiness artificially, you diminish the need for God's grace. There is a biblical doctrine of of self-esteem, but it's not rooted in our wonderfulness, our lovability. It's rooted in God's design for the creation. He designed human beings to occupy the exalted position over creation. And more than that, he designed that human beings would rule with a delegated authority over everything that he's made. Now that is the dignity that God has given to people made in his image. So the question here in the mind of these original readers is, so how then could Jesus be superior to angels, right? How could he rule in the age to come if he was truly a man? And and his response is clear. It's because this was God's design from the beginning. Chapter 1 in the very first book of the Bible teaches us that dominion over God's created order was God's intended purpose for humanity from the outset. Tracking with me? Just one small problem here to this, though. I don't know if you've noticed. Has this happened yet? Do you, do you look around and, and observe that all of creation is under subjection to humanity? I don't think so. Certainly, the angels don't be to subject. Don't be seem to be subject to us. can't do whatever we want. So, so how is this playing itself out? This is the problem that the writer wants you to sit with for just a second before he shows you the solution. He says at the end of verse 8, Hebrews 2, verse 8, at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Right? In other words, we don't yet see God's design from the garden worked out in our world, do we? Why not? because of the entrance of sin into the world. 
As a result of sin, our dominion has become twisted, perverted. And all of creation, which was originally designed to serve us, to meet our needs, for us to enjoy, now that same creation fights against us at every turn. Now, even in the fallen state of things, right, we know that creation still brings us great pleasure. It provides us with numerous benefits. But the point is, as a consequence of sin, it's now a fight. It's a struggle. Creation resists our dominion. Remember, back in Genesis 3, as part of the curse for sin, God told Adam that thorns and thistles would now infest the ground. Right? And I take that to mean he's talking about more than just weeds in your garden. This is representative of the struggle against the created order in totality. We have animals that you know, are designed originally to be our companions that, that fear us or can even kill us. Even some plants can kill us, right? Whatever, whatever human beings can manage to create, whether it be a skyscraper or a, a field of wheat, that can be undone in a second by an earthquake or a strike of lightning. Creation resists our dominion. And, and when we do, when we human beings do manage to actually exercise a little bit of dominion over creation, well, how would we rate our job performance at that? I don't know where you, whether you're an environmentalist or not, but you can agree, I think, that we've certainly mismanaged our natural resources, right? You think about even just the dominion that we have over our fellow human beings. You just need to think about names like Stalin and Mao and Hitler. And so really, we should read Hebrews 2, verse 7 like this, realizing it's talking about us. You made him for a little while lower than the angels? You crowned him with glory and honor? You put everything under his feet? You left nothing outside his control? At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Yeah, no kidding. We don't see anything close to that. So does that mean that God's purposes have been thwarted then? That, that we've sinned ourselves out of God's original design for human dignity? Is this whole thing some kind of cosmic chess game where uh, Satan, God made one move and then Satan just kind of outwitted him? Well, let's remind ourselves that God's purposes never, ever fail. They are not for a moment thwarted. Dominion over all of creation was God's intended purpose from the beginning. And now from our perspective, it certainly seems that sin coming into the world has jeopardized that purpose because we certainly do not see, at the moment, God's original design for man in place. But there is something that we do see at the moment. It's verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. This is significant because this is the first time in this letter that Jesus is referred to by his human name. So far earlier in the letter, he's been called the Son of He's been called God. He's been called Lord. All terms that speak of his deity, right? His godness. But here he's referred to by the name Jesus. The name that speaks of his humanity. Why? Because the point that this writer is making here is that Jesus, in Jesus, the greater man, all of God's intended purposes for humanity will be realized, including dominion over all of creation. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Now again, dominion over the created order, that was God's original design for humanity from the beginning. The problem is... Adam lost that privilege for the human race. And so our only hope is that someone can come along and undo 
the effects of Adam's sin. Right? We need a, a true and better Adam. And there is one who meets that description. Only one person is capable of undoing these effects. But, in order to be our true representative, this second Adam had to share in our condition. And so for a little while, he himself became lower than the angels. Jesus came and, and took on a human body. A body that could bleed, a body that could die, a body that was limited in the way, in a way that angels are not limited. Think about how, how vast of a condescension this is that the eternal second person of the Trinity had to stoop beneath the angels that he'd created. But even then, it's not merely enough for him to come as a human being. He had to come and bear the consequences of the sins of human beings. Before, before we can ever experience God's appointed dominion, Jesus had to come and experience God's appointed condemnation. And he did that to the full. Verse 9 says he suffered death. He tasted death. The idea is he experienced the full experience of death in all of its ugliness and bitterness. And then because he accomplished what he had come to do, God raised him from the dead, took him to heaven, seated him at his right hand, and Jesus has now been crowned with glory and honor as the second Adam, the greater man, the first, the head, the forerunner, the first fruits of a new humanity, a true humanity in whom God's intended purpose from the beginning will be realized. See, God's original plan, God's original design is not frustrated because a greater man has come to us. Jesus is like our foothold into glory. He, he restores everything for us that Adam lost in sin. That's why he had to come as a man. That's why he had to bleed and die as a man. And that's why, as a man in the world to come, he will rule over all things, exercising dominion over all things, including the angels. Again, we don't ever need to be preoccupied with angels, right? We want to be preoccupied with the greater man, Jesus Christ. So the second part of his question here, well, the first part, remember, was that dominion over the created order was God's original design from the beginning. The second part of his answer is that design for humanity is achieved because of Jesus Christ, the greater man, the greater Adam. So how does this affect us? Well, I don't know if you're feeling this way now, but I am guessing that you probably have at some point. Have you ever felt small or insignificant, unimportant, thinking, you know, I'm, I'm just an ordinary average person at best. If I dropped off the planet tomorrow, I don't even know if somebody would notice. Right? I could be replaced at my job in a second. Somebody could be a better parent or grandparent than I am. And, and the truth is, it won't be too long until all of our memories are covered in dust. So what, what worth is there to your existence? What does it matter that you were even born? And then think about us here as a church. Who are we? Nothing impressive by a long shot, right? Maybe a, like 130 people on a good day. Half of that kids. In, in this little building here that we've, you know, we've done our best with. We're not particularly intelligent or, or powerful or or wealthy, or influential. And think about where we live. Right, We're in this little town in eastern Oregon that 
that pales in significance to the bigger cities in our state where real power and influence and wealth lies. We're this, we're this small little conservative outpost in the larger liberal culture. We may not be sitting in the shadows of imperial Rome, but it's still easy for us to feel marginalized in this world, particularly because we're Christians. Do you feel the weight of that sometimes, if you really think about it? And so look then at what God says about you, about us. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. We haven't experienced that yet. But we will, most certainly, because the greater man has come. We're, we are fully human, but we are not truly human until our life is hid with Christ. The true human, the perfect human. From, from the very beginning, God's designs on your life were greater than anything you can imagine. His plan for believers is that we would join with him in ruling over all of creation. Now, for, for a time, sin threatened that, to be sure. But because of Jesus Christ, and because of your attachment to him this morning, if in fact you do trust him, then you can know that all of God's glorious purposes that he spells out for us in his word will be realized. But the thing is, remember, did he do this for you? Will he do this for you because you're so great and so special? Did he, did he do this because you're really worth saving? Did you, did you think I skipped over that little line in verse 9? But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that... By the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He will do this for you, believer, not because you're so great or wonderful or worthy, but because he is gracious beyond knowing. Never forget that grace was fully accomplished in the past, right? But grace also remains to be fully experienced by us in the future. Will you get there? Yes, if you're a believer, you can be confident in that. Why? Because the greater man is already there. So what I'd like you to think about this morning is, have you experienced the benefits of knowing this greater man? Have you experienced the benefits of this greater man coming to us in human flesh? Have you experienced the benefits of the greater man's death on the cross? Have you experienced the benefits of his resurrection from the dead and his ascension to heaven? Have you experienced the benefits of the greater man being seated right now at the right hand of the Father? If so, then you will experience the benefits of ruling with him in the world to come. It's a, you can't get your mind around that, what that means. But if not... Should you persist in rejecting him, your experience will be what it's like to be a footstool for his feet. Jesus has won all of the privileges for those who come to him by faith. So if you've never done that, I urge you this morning to do that very thing. By the grace of God, come to Jesus and embrace the greater man for life and salvation. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.